everyone. So today we're going to uh, continue some examples of complex functions that show up a lot in complex analysis. The last two days we've been looking at Mobius transformations and what we're going to do today is take the familiar functions um, of e to the x and cosine and sine and define them for all complex numbers. So the exponential function, we've already talked about it a little bit. Let me remind you um, from a lecture video from the first week of class, actually, uh, just to recall that if we consider Taylor series, uh, the Taylor series for e to the x, cosine x and sine x. So these are uh, just, just real valued functions right now. And in calc 3 or calc 2, you figured out what their Taylor series were. And if you remember from that previous lecture video, um, if we just look at what these Taylor series are, and if we remember the rule uh, of how to multiply i that i squared equals minus 1, you get that uh, as Taylor series, if I plug in e to the i times a real number, call it y, so e to the i y, it ends up, so th this Taylor series, if I just plug in i y for x into the Taylor series for e to the x, it ends up being equal to the Taylor series of cosine y plus i times the Taylor series of sine of y. And that comes from just looking at the real and imaginary parts of this Taylor series. So it kind of makes sense to define the exponential of an imaginary number to be this thing. And that's exactly what we're going to do. So what I want to do now is say, OK, well, we know what e to the x is for a real number. We know what um, e to an imaginary number is. So what about an arbitrary complex number, which is a sum of its real and imaginary parts? That's what we want to do. So we want to somehow come up with a reasonable definition for e to the z for z equals x plus i y. And OK, so if we do this, just write this out. So e to the z, whatever it is, it's, it's equal to e to the x plus i y because z is x plus i y. And now you know, I don't know if, if rules of exponents work for complex numbers, but, but if they do, so hopefully they do, and if they do, then I can separate this as e to the x times e to the i y. Because at least for real numbers, right, at, at least for real numbers, uh, we have this rule of exponents that e to a sum of two real numbers is equal to the product of those exponents. And so let's just kind of define it this way, define this to be that so that the rule of exponents still holds. And then we, we can say what this is because this is e to a real number times e to an imaginary number and both of those we have definitions for. So this is going to be equal to just e to the x times e to the i y, which we already saw a reasonable definition for that is cosine y plus i times sine of y. So this is, this is how we're going to define the exponent of z. And I just want to emphasize, I just want to emphasize that this this equality is, is not something that we know because we actually haven't defined what this left side means yet. I'm just saying uh, if it were true, then I could simplify this to be that, and that would give me a reasonable definition for e to the z. But it's a definition, so 
we're defining it this way. So I'm going to define the function exp of z to be uh, what, what we came up with before, so e to the x times cosine y plus i sine y. Because from looking at Taylor series and using rule of exponents for real numbers, it seems like this is a reasonable definition for what it should be. Um, now I'm using the notation exp of z instead of e to the z here. You should think of this as e to the z, but I'm just using this new notation to emphasize that this is a new function that I'm defining. It, it's not it's not coming from the, the previous exponential function for real numbers. It's just a definition. I'm defining it to be this thing. Um, of course, where x and y are the real and imaginary parts of z. OK, so that's a definition. This gives us a new function. called exp, and um, where is it defined? What's its domain? Well, x and y can be anything, and this expression is a well-defined complex number, so its domain is all of c. So we get a function defined on all of c. Um, the first thing you might ask is, is it a nice function? Uh, in particular, where is it differentiable? And this is a great place to use the cauchy riemann equations. So let's let's do that. So um, what do we have to do? We have to look at the partial with respect to x of this function x of z, and i times the partial with respect to y x of z. And if they're equal, then the cauchy riemann equations hold. Um, okay, so what is x of z? Well, it's this right here. And I know how to take the derivative with respect to x here, treating y as a constant. Um, I know the derivative of e to the x, because x is just a real number here. Uh, it's just itself. And so in this case, I get exactly what I started with. I don't know why I added those. OK, um, because this is just a constant. And so I'm just doing constant times e to the x. Its derivative is itself. Uh, d dy is a little more complicated. So I'm multiplying by i first. And e to the x is a constant now. It's treated as a constant. It goes along for the ride. Derivative of cosine of a real number uh, is, is negative sine of that number. And then derivative of sine is cosine, so plus i cosine y. And I'm multiplying this whole thing by i, so I can rewrite this in terms of its real and imaginary parts. So this is e to the x. So the real part is coming from multiplying i times i, because that's a minus 1. And so I get minus, so i squared, which is minus, uh, times cosine y. And then wait a minute. <laughs> and then and then the imaginary part is i times negative sine of y, so minus i sine of y. And I made a little typo here. The Cauchy Riemann equations say you should multiply this by negative i and then see if they're equal, right? And so now they're now they're equal. So we get that ddx of the function is equal to negative i times ddy of the function. So the Cauchy Riemann equations are satisfied. Now remember there's one technical condition that actually you also need to then conclude that this function exp is differentiable, and that is that the partials have to be continuous.
So also we need to check that. So also notice that the partials here and the partial with respect to y are continuous functions. And that, that's clear because cosine's continuous, sine's continuous, so the sum of continuous things is continuous. e to the x is continuous, so the product of these two is continuous. So the partials are continuous, um, and that plus the fact that the Cauchy-Riemann equations hold, they are satisfied, that together tells us that this function is differentiable everywhere for all complex numbers. Um, and, you know, just using another vocab word, uh, another way to say it is that this is an entire function. But that just means it's differentiable everywhere. Okay, so now I have definition of the exponential of z, so what, what e to the z should be. Um, and what we want to know now is does it behave like the exponential function that I'm used to? So a homework problem for you is you're going to check that the usual properties of the exponential function hold. hold for this new complex exponential function, which I'm calling exp. So, you know, what are these properties? Well, uh, for instance, like, we hope that it obeys the usual exponential rule. For complex numbers, not just for real numbers. Um, you know, the other, like, most interesting thing is it'd be nice, you know, the derivative of e to the x for a real value x is, is equal to itself. It'd be nice if that was true for this new complex exponential function. And um, both of these properties do hold. This one, you're going to have to go back to the definition. Uh, in terms of real and imaginary parts, and it's going to come down to some trig identities for cosine and sine. Uh, this one is coming from the Cauchy-Riemann equations again, because remember that part of that theorem, um, what section was that? So, somewhere in chapter two of the book about the Cauchy-Riemann equations said that if your function is differentiable, then you can calculate that derivative by looking at the partial with respect to x. And if we go back, what was the partial with respect to x of this function? It was exactly the function itself, right? It was exactly x of z. And so from that theorem, that tells us that um, that's what ddz of x of z is. So that, that one's kind of automatic from the work that we've done already. Um, there's one really important new property which is not at all similar to the real exponential function. It's kind of weird. This new property is the following. If I add 2 pi i to the input of z, I get the exact same value that I started with. And I mean, one thing that this tells you immediately is that the exponential function, the complex exponential function, is not injective. It's not one-to-one. One-to-one. Um, whereas with the, you know, with the real exponential function, it is. So that's already something new. Um, but, th but this is kind of a 
really nice property. It, it tells us that another way of saying it is that this is a periodic function. Um, other periodic functions that you've seen before are sine and cosine, where if you add 2 pi to their input, it doesn't change the output. In this case, it's periodic, uh, but you're adding an imaginary number. It doesn't change the output. So it's period is imaginary. Um, and the proof of this fact is coming exactly from the definition and from the periodic nature of cosine and sine. Because you see that adding, um, adding 2 pi i just changes y by 2 pi, and you know that cosine and sine don't, don't change when you modify them by 2 pi. So that's why, that, that's why that's true. Um, can, we, can we graph this function? So, I mean, of course, not really, because the domain is C, and the range is C, and so, you know, in terms of real coordinates, that's, that's four-dimensional. The graph would live in a four-dimensional space, so that's kind of difficult to do, but I can at least draw a copy of the domain and draw another copy uh, where, where the image goes and see where different points go. So let's let's try to do this. So here's my axes. So let's just experiment with some different points. So where does the origin go? Um, the origin is a real number, has no imaginary part, and so x of zero, maybe I'll make a little table here. Uh, so my input, my output, x of 0 is just e to the 0, which is 1. Okay, that's nice. Um, and now what, the, what this previous property tells me is if I, if I add 2 pi i, um, I get the same value as before. So actually, 2 pi i also lands here. And you can deduce from that property that any multiple of 2 pi i is going to go to the same point as well. So that they all go to 1. Um, and, and what happens for other points between here? So like this point here, maybe this is pi times i. Well, what, what does that do to x of z? Um, I've just changed the imaginary part, which if you look back up here, it's, it's really only changing the argument. And so it doesn't change the modulus of the output. It changes just the argument of the output. And in this case, the argument is just the imaginary part. And so um, I get minus one for that, draw an x there. And if I go up this line, I'm just changing the imaginary part of my input, which changes the argument in my output. And so I get everything with modulus one and any possible argument. So that, that's where the y-axis goes. It just loops over and over the unit circle. Um, let me say this. Let me kind of emphasize what I said before. So um, if z equals x plus i, y, you know, as we've already seen, well, I guess if you use rules of exponents, this is going to be equal to e to the z, e to the i, y. And so the modulus of x of z is exactly given by e to the x, and the argument of x of z is exactly y. And so this makes it really easy to, um, to see where points are going to go. You just have to, you're going to write the output in polar coordinates, basically. Um, this is another uh, reason why 
changing the input by 2 pi i doesn't change the output uh, because this is just modifying the argument and we're modifying the argument by 2 pi which just means we've gone all the way around the circle. Uh, let's, let's do a couple others. So maybe if I look at the point 1, uh, where does that go? So that's a real number. Argument is 0 and so it goes to the point with modulus e to the 1, which is e, and argument 0. So it just maps to e, the real number. And then again, if I go up by 2 pi i, so here's 1 plus 2 pi i, as I'm changing the imaginary part, that's just changing the argument of my output, and I'm getting all the points on a circle centered at the origin of radius e. Um, let's say I went here to 1 plus pi over 2i, then I've just modified my argument by pi over 2, and so this point here goes to this point here, which is e cosine pi over 2 plus i sine pi over 2. Okay, and so, so what this function is doing is it's sending vertical lines um, let's do one that's negative actually it's, it's sending vertical lines to uh, circles the input is a vertical line, the output is a circle centered at the origin uh, I'll do one more, so might as well do negative one so negative one, e to the minus one is one over e so that's like right here and this vertical line gets mapped to that circle of radius 1 over e. Okay, and so I, if, if you explore this a little further you'll see that this function x of z is almost surjective. It hits every point of the complex numbers except for the origin. It, it doesn't hit the origin but everything else. And as you go further and further back negative, you get closer and circles closer and closer to the origin. And further and further positive, you get larger and larger circles. And this is, yeah, just like in um, regular calculus, this is a super important function. One big reason is because it's, it's the function whose derivative is equal to itself. So we'll spend a lot of time on this function. Um, just, a, just a few others. So you might wonder, can we define cosine and sine with complex inputs? And we can start with cosine. I'm just going to tell you the definition, and it looks kind of crazy at first. So it's going to be 1 half. We'll use the exponential function to define it. It's going to be 1 half exp iz plus exp of minus iz. So it's, it's not super surprising that there's a connection between cosine and exponential because even when we defined the exponential function, we were using cosine as part of the definition. Um, but nevertheless, if you haven't seen it before, you look at this and you're like, that seems pretty crazy. Um, so why is, this, why is this the definition? Well, um, I'll leave it as an exercise for you. The, the definition is really coming from looking at Taylor series again, just like how we use Taylor series to think about the exponential of complex numbers. So what you can check is that if you look at the Taylor series for, um, again, the exponential function, and the cosine function. You should uh, check that these, these two things, this and this, uh, give the same Taylor series. Oops. <laughs> 
And so that's really where it's coming from. So once we have the definition of exp, um, we can just use it to define cosine. It's just coming from thinking about the Taylor series again. Um, another, I mean, another thing you should check, this is really important, is that if I plug a real number x into into the right hand side here so into this function I'll just call this star so if I plug that in for z into the right hand side um, then using the definition of the exponential function I get I get exactly cosine of x so when I plug in real numbers into this um, like a real number x in for z then it simplifies to just cosine x so at least this right hand side agrees with our usual definition of the cosine function when we have real numbers as the inputs and so it's just extending it to complex numbers. Um, similarly, sine of z looks really weird at first, but again, it's just coming from comparing the Taylor series. And again, you can check that if you plug in real numbers to the right-hand side that I'm writing, it'll give you the usual sign of that number. Uh, let me write this better. Um, and so yeah, that's that's cosine and sine. One one nice thing about these definitions of the complex cosine and sine is that they're automatically entire functions. They're automatically differentiable everywhere. Auto that's not what I mean. <laughs> automatically. And you could show this using Cauchy-Riemann equations, but you don't need to because let's do sine, for instance. Um, exp we already checked was differentiable, and you know multiplying by a constant is differentiable. So this is a composition of differentiable functions, so it's differentiable. Same with this one. The difference of two differentiable functions is differentiable, and then again, I'm just multiplying by a constant, still differentiable. So using the fact that the exponential function is, is entire tells us that the sine function is entire, and the same for cosine. And so one other property that you may want to check to kind of convince yourself that these are reasonable definitions for sine and cosine is that their derivatives behave the way we would like them to. So it should be the case that the derivative of sine of z equals cosine of z and that the derivative of cosine is minus sine. Oops. The derivative of cosine of z should be minus sine of z, and that, that does indeed still hold. Um, and how would you prove this? Prove this using the chain rule and the fact which we already saw that ddz of exp is just itself. Since cosine and sine are defined using exp, that's how you would want to prove this. Um, okay, and then there's a few other important functions that are in this section of the book, but these are the three main ones, so these are the ones I wanted to focus on. And next time we will talk about the logarithm.